Yo, yo, what's up everybody? This is your F1 card strategy show and this is episode four of the F1 card strategy show. I'm Paul Hickey with NoOffSeason.com, the sports card content network. And I've got with me today my super famous host, Greg Longtoe. He's, uh, in case in case you don't know, he does a lot in Canada, including uh, hosting some sports card shows up in Canada. And um, English is his second language. So I'm always, I'm always amazed at my man, how he brings it strong in English on the F1 card strategy show. And uh, Greg, how you doing today, man? I'm good yourself. Thank you for the kind words, my man. That's uh, just trying to make the most out of my um, education with uh, two languages that I'm very functional with. So uh, yeah, pretty happy about it. Yeah, yeah, it's super impressive, super impressive. So, um, all right, so today I want to, there's two guys specifically that I want to talk about, and I know you're probably, you probably have some topics that you want to cover on today's show. Um, but the two guys I want to talk about in no particular order are George Russell and Felipe Drugovic. And we've talked a lot about Russell on the F1 card strategy show already, but yeah. We haven't really talked at all about Drugovic. You and I have messaged recently about him on Facebook Messenger. Um, but uh, before we jump into those guys, actually, Greg, why don't, why don't you kind of give us just a little bit of, a, of your overall take on, on F1 right now? You know, since our last show, there's been a couple of races. There was Barcelona and Monaco. What did you yeah. see in, in those two races? And what are you seeing right now, you know, F1, F2, whatever you want to cover, just kind of the landscape of everything. Kind of let's let's give give the audience a little bit of an update. And 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 um, la- lastly, I will say this show, we want it to be for both. This is hard to do, but we want it to be for both newbies, noobs, and uh, and like and like hardcore F1 people. So the reason I say that is because um, we want your comments, we want your feedback. We'd we'd love it if you comment on youtube if you're if you're more of a facebook person you can join the facebook group it's called sports card strategy um so but we want we want some f1 discussion from the audience so let us know what you want to hear about whether you're a a new person to f1 cards or whether you're just a you've been an f1 diehard your entire life and you've been all you do is f1 cards so all right with that said greg give us your thoughts on kind of um what you've seen in the last couple weeks with the races Well, let me go a little higher up and have a macro look at all of the market. Um, when you look at the card market right now, it, it's been pretty slow and stable. And I think that it's, there's a few reasons about that. And it, it's been told on many different platforms, many different podcasts by experts that have been longer than myself, longer than uh, you even in the, um, in the market. And I think it's a pretty, from what I'm experiencing now, I can't say I've been in the, in the market, in the hobby for uh, many, many years. Uh, so I, I cannot talk about my past experience, but what the information I'm gathering right now is that it's normal to see different markets slowing down. I know hockey's heating up and it's pretty normal because we're in the Stanley Cup playoffs. There's some speculation, but hockey is not the biggest market. It's not driving the card market forward. Uh, F1 is a pretty hot product, therefore. um, And I mean, uh, okay, sorry. Let me rewind a couple of seconds there. If you look at, there's many different reasons. I know National is coming in in a few weeks. Um, there's also the global economic, um, I'll say, I don't want to say format, but global economic, uh, standpoint where, uh, everything is slowing down crypto stocks. I mean, I looked at my stocks recently, everything went down and, you know, there's, uh, uh, not a lot of good news on economic, um, um, fu- on the economic future on the the short term so 
therefore, we see also if we now come down to the card market in F1, there's some, I'll say, confusion and correction about everything. When uh, Topps Chrome 2021 came out, we saw a spike in value of both 2021, who uh, the hobby boxes rose up very, very high. And same thing happened with 2020. The, the box went up to 4 4.5k something like that just for a hobby box everything went after everyone went after those and now they are slowing down we we see a dip in those prices we see a dip in uh different prices for different drivers and i think there's a few reasons for that the poor results from uh obviously hamilton like he's still probably not probably he's still the most sought after driver that we have in there because you know lewis is lewis and his poor results have been driving his prices down plus add to that everything that's going on with the economic uh um what word could i use economic climate i mean Can I say you that could that? you could say climate landscape situation yeah. i mean all, all of this situation plus the releases of many different products like chrome came out then uh dynasty came out then sapphire came out it's like been three releases boom 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 right after one right after the other and now it seems like people are plus the people that have been grading their chrome cards their chrome hits every card that were raw in the market and pretty new so hot stocks are coming back now from psa coming back from sgc bgs all of those grading companies and flooding quote unquote the market with uh, you know more population of different cards and as a buyer even for myself been looking for investing in many different cards now you're looking at what's going on in the market and you're like okay but what should i buy what am i buying and uh dynasty was kind of a flop also this year when you saw the box prices pretty high and the cards that uh, we discussed about it the, the card prices that you could barely you know make your money back on the box by opening it so this is the market right now it's slowing down it's an investment opportunity or even for collectors if you want to collect you know lewis hamilton the card you've always been dreaming of it's probably the time right now to buy it, you know, uh, before we, uh, we move on to Azerbaijan and uh, the Grand Prix I will be attending, Canada and Montreal right here. So uh, this is it. Will it go back up? I'm, you know, everyone is unanimous about it. You know, it, it's, a, it, it's an opportunity of market for people to, to invest, to get the cards that they want to collect. So what? I think F1 is still a buy even more than it was a few months back. Now, on to the drivers. The, the Charles Leclerc bubble has burst officially. Uh, what, a, what a mess up, not to say other, uh, other things, that Ferrari team, these Ferrari, you saw those memes online, Paul, just like myself, just like everyone. Um, the memes coming out. Oh, the clowns at Ferrari are back. Uh, they messed up by uh, telling Charles to box and then stay out. <laughs> Pretty heartbreaking moment there for Ferrari fans, for Charles fans. But his prices are dropping like crazy. And now we see that Max Verstappen is on. I don't want to, you know, have a bad joke here. That joke in the driver's seat for the championship. Um, he's gaining momentum and we are moving on to a part of the calendar that Red Bull will have a better car than Ferrari because they are faster on, um, on, on top speed. They're better on top speed while Ferrari is better on, um, on accelerating and, you know, fast corners, which uh, will, you know, if you look at Azerbaijan circuit, if you look at the Montreal circuit, both of these uh, have long stretches and um, yeah, that's it. So Red Bull, you know, if 
you have Charles cards right now, I would hold. I would not sell at this moment. I would wait uh, and, and see. Probably hold long term. They're, uh, in my opinion, Charles won't win in the next races. And Max will do so. And look at a guy that you didn't mention. You want to talk, talk about Drugovic. And you want to talk about um, George Russell. But I'm telling you, I, I would not have never said that at the beginning of the season. Look at Checo Perez. Okay. Yeah, I wanted. I, I would love to get your take on him as well. Do you think this this uh, these recent performances are legit? They're going to continue. Talk 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 to us about him and his cards, if you if you can. Well, I don't think that um, I don't think that uh, Red Bull will ever put um, Perez in front of Verstappen, and we saw that in Barcelona, right? They asked. Uh, they asked to play the, the team policy and to let Max pass for the win. But now that Max is first um, in the championship, they probably will want Checo to be the ultimate teammate and pass Leclerc for second place, which, which can happen, which can happen because of um, everything I said in the past minutes. So, um, okay. Yeah, I mean, if Perez continues to go with these performances, he won in Monaco. He he can actually challenge uh, Leclerc, definitely. And we can see some Red Bull battles, you know, again, quote-unquote, because they won't, they, they won't let... It happened in the past. Christian Horner remembers that. You know, they won't let their two drivers uh, collide with one another and, and crash. So... I mean, if you look at the prices of Checo Perez in the past week or so, um, it went it, it went crazy. I mean, uh, people now see him as a legit driver. He signed another contract with um, Red Bull for, for another two years until 2024. So there's no more speculation around, uh, is Checo Perez going to be replaced by Pierre Gasly at Red Bull? or um, so on and so forth. So um, with the speculation out of it, now it's all for him to continue and perform. And he, he's proven that when he's given a good car and he's given the uh, freedom to drive, he can be a very, very fast driver. And um, check, yeah, his value is on the rise, man. Interesting. So I'm glad you brought him up. So let's talk about this for a second, because this is kind of a concept that I've been really, really digging into throughout all of the, all of the player profiles that I've been writing for nooffseason.com for the sports card investment report. And, and I want to make sure that I'm advising our subscribers to the premium side and, and to our audience here on the, on the, the shows that we put out like timing being important, right? So the way that I would look at Perez right now, and correct me if I'm wrong, is I would look at him as like, yes, a legit driver. Yes, he's on my radar. Yes, it would be super cool. I mean, depending on who you are, it's a super cool storyline to think, man, he could finish second, Max first, Team Red Bull at the top. You know, again, depending on who you are, that's, that could be a really cool storyline. But coming off of Monaco, is now really the time to buy him. Wouldn't, wouldn't you say, like, wait until maybe he finishes fifth or seventh or eighth and maybe grab some points but doesn't, don't buy him right after a win? Because I think, to your point earlier, uh, it does seem like the F F1 card market is kind of mimicking the other sport card markets where it's like there is a clear time to buy and there is a clear time to sell. And you could look at Leclerc like a time to buy right now. You could look at Hamilton like a time to buy right now. Um, I think you could even look at Russell. That's one of the reasons why I want, want to talk about Russell is because you could look at Russell maybe as a time to buy right now. And I have some specific questions for you about him. But, but I'm well, glad Russell you brought up been... Perez because it's, is now really the time to buy Perez? It's a, it's a, it's a good question. The, the, the market – has not reacted necessarily to wins um, recently when you look at the data. 
And I mean, um, I'll, I'll put you like this. I'll put it to you like this. He won Monaco. Is it a time to buy? No. If he wins in Azerbaijan, what happens? It's the same situation. What, what you're asking me now is... Leclerc, what, right? <laughs> well... Same yeah, situation uh, we saw earlier well, this year with Leclerc, I would think. Exactly. And the, the, second, the, the second situation is pretty much like... I would compare it to the NFL playoffs. And I, I'm not yeah. dictating the futures there. I'm not dictating the future of the market there. But what I'm saying is I feel like what we saw with Charles was pretty similar to what happened to Joe Burrow during the playoffs. Every single yes. week, after every single win, his cards were rising. So was it the time to buy Joe Burrow after he won his first playoff game? No, but yes. After the mm -hmm. second week? No, but yes. So was it the time to buy him uh, before the Super Bowl? Uh, probably not. So, you know, right before the conference finals. So he won now. It, it's, it's pretty much the same situation. Uh, and I'll, I'll go in the soccer market right now as Malik Tillman. You know, Malik Tillman has a hype around him. He just announced that he's going to be uh, in the U.S. men's national team. And he played his first game yesterday. He played a few minutes. Did, did okay. Did well. Is, it, is he a buy? No. But yes, again, we'll, we'll, you know, the World yeah. Cup is coming. He will play as a starter at the World Cup. I think he's going to be part of that team. Uh, and obviously, uh, he's going to be an important part of that team uh, on the midfield. So, once again, yes, there's hype. I mean, the time to buy Perez was probably when there was speculation and his price wasn't going up, you know. So, other than in the yeah. past, you know, if, if he finishes fifth, fifth you, as the example you, you said, if he finishes fifth or have, you know, one or two races, um, the speculation is still going to be there. And I don't think it will drive his market down. Unless yeah, and generally you're right. Like his sales, there haven't really been many sales, if any sales. I'm looking right now on Market Movers app by Sports Card Investor. You can uh, get your first month there for only a dollar if you use the promo code no off season. And, and I don't really see many, uh, many sales. So I think you're right. I mean, and I think, I guess as someone who I know you're, you're primarily F1 in soccer, although you have bought, you have bought basketball and, and football cards in the past and probably hold still a few of those. <clears throat> like for me, I buy basketball, I buy basketball, soccer, football, F1, a little bit of baseball, not that much. Um, I would think that like if you're only an F1 person, you probably are looking at Perez. You probably are looking at Sainz, Ocon. We talked about Gasly on the last show. You know, you probably are looking at some of those guys. You're probably looking at Drugovich maybe, or maybe you should be. We're, if you're not, we're going to talk about him in a second. But, um, but I think if you're, if you're buying, like if you're, if you're buying other sports and F1, Perez might not be the guy for you. And I say that because like you're in a situation where your investment portfolio looks a lot different than like an F1 only person. What do, what do you think about that, Greg? You know, does that make oh, sense? I, I, I agree with you. Um, I agree with you. Is there a play? Is there a play to be made there? Uh, of course. But is it going to be the first driver you want to buy? I mean, no, of course not. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. but, but again, uh, it, it's all about, it's all about finding opportunities in the market. I think Sergio Perez is an interesting one. He has a huge following, obviously in Mexico, Central America has, you know, huge, um, sponsors that, that come with him. So, I mean, of course, if you have that kind of money to put on a driver, uh, I would tell you to go with Lewis or Max um, or, or any yeah. other prospect. But if you are in the market and you see a deal that's coming up, 
that could be interesting. Yeah. So I think we, we kind of hit on, yeah, we're aligned on that. I think we kind of just hit on a, a difference between like F1 prospecting and, and just getting into F1. And there's a reason why we have Lewis as number two overall on our sports card investment report at no off season. And I think Max is number seven, just because we, we feel like those are the guys, like they're still sort of underpriced and it's a good time to buy based on who they are. And so, um, before we get to Drugovich, I want to talk about uh, timing another guy because I feel like George Russell kind of straddles both worlds. He's someone that F1 people have been really, really high on for the last couple of years. There's been a lot of hype around him. He has performed this year. Um, He's the only driver, I believe, still to have a top five finish in every race. Um, yes. And, uh, but he's also someone that F1 people who are just dipping their toe in the water for the first time are also familiar with and have invested in. And so my question to you is, when is George Russell going to win his first race? Oh, uh, my God. Until the end of the season. I think so. If not, it will be next year. And next year, I think Mercedes will be a legit contender for the World Drivers Championship. And if you look at what is George is doing with this car, he's absolutely going to be a contender. So if it's not this year, it's next year for sure. And uh, yeah, he'll be he'll be definitely a contender. So I mean, George is George is an absolute stud uh is he the favorite of you know the favorite of all uh i don't think so <laughs> uh when, when you look at you know his personality uh lando norris has the spark star potential uh way more than than george but george has the car and every serious f1 fan is loving george so yeah, you, you got that factor. And once again, he, he is very consistent in the top five this year. He's the only driver on the grid who's placed top five every time. Um, is it because he's the best driver on the grid? I don't think so. I mean, Lewis, Lewis has, has been bad lucked a lot of times, including in Monaco. I mean, Kevin Magnussen in Barcelona bumped into Lewis. And Ocon in Monaco as well, plus a red flag in qualifying that prevent him to go higher on the grid while he was showing a good pace. So, uh, yeah, I, I, George is an interesting guy. And, of course, and everyone will agree that he will be world champion one day. But does that dictate that his prices will skyrocket if he does so? Not necessarily, because if you look at Max, Max prices have not been to where they should be after he won his world championship, you know? Yeah. So we have um, Russell as a buy and hold right now at nooffseason.com. And basically for the reasons that you stated, um, I think it seems like his prices is, have taken a dip a small dip based on the, the world markets that you mentioned early on in the show and not necessarily because of his performance. And it seems like it's only a matter of time before he wins his first race. And my guess is that when he does win his first race, we will see a spike and that could, and it just depends on the situation that you're in with George. If you've got a lot tied up in George and maybe you're a little bit upside down and this, and that spike when it does come would be an opportunity for you to, to get a little bit more liquid in this economy. Uh, if there is a spike, I would, I would maybe encourage you to, to get out of George at that time. In the meantime, though, I would hold. And obviously, don't just, don't just get out of George because he wins a race. You want to make sure that you know, you're seeing more interest in his cards um, in, in some other, maybe some other eBay auctions, check the amount of bids. Um, we talk about my slabs, maybe, maybe go on my slabs and look at some sold listings of George. They do a good job with that. So there's a lot of different ways to get your data. But the reason, 
The main reason I wanted to talk about George is because one of our plays of the month at nooffseason.com, when you're a premium subscriber to our investment report, we've added different plays of the month on player profiles. And we do see that his 2020 Topps Chrome F1 Sapphire Edition base is down 30% over the last 30 days. It was at $700. Now it's at $495. This is a PSA 10, by the way. PSA 10, 2020 Topps Chrome Sapphire Edition base. So my thought is, if you're just starting off in F1, um, or you've got a really solid portfolio and you can afford to make a play, that might not be a bad idea to take a look at seeing if you can get George down almost 30% on a card like that. Because um, it seems to me that as the season goes on and as he continues to perform and when he does win his first race, there could be a little bit of profit there for you. On, and, and that's a lower end card. I would say if you're, if you're, and that's a good way to get in, you know, if you're new to F1. The other thing is though, if, if you're, you're holding big George stuff, it all depends on what cards you have, right, Greg? Like if you're holding big George stuff, like autos or even, even like, the 2020 uh, purple refractor, which is out of 399. Like I would consider that and anything else above that, like a bigger George card. I would mm-hmm. say like, probably this is a long-term hold to your point. If everyone agrees that he's a future world champion, even though you just said there's no guarantee of a price spike, if you're holding it right now, chances are you're going to have a profit margin when he does get to that level. So, I mean, how do you see Russell compared to what I just said? Do you see him as like, a short-term flip when he wins a race or do you see him as a long-term hold hold him after even after he starts winning races i definitely see him as a long-term hold if you i mean both situation could be interesting but i don't think that everyone will go crazy on his pricing when he wins one race because everyone expects that from him it's just like okay. saying, um, I don't know, Jason Tatum wins one round. And, I, and you know, it, it's, it's probably okay. just stating the obvious there, but uh, I'm, I'm trying to give uh, another. It, it's like, did you see a big spike in Vinicius Jr. in his Champions League un, un, until he scored the actual winning goal to win the Champions League? Then we saw the hype coming back, you know, and people going back on the Vini train. It, for me, it's kind of the same. Everyone expects George to be good, very good. And when he actually leads on a consistent basis the World Drivers' Championship, then I would consider selling. And even then, if you think he's going to win, still hold. That, 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 that would be my play there. Okay, that's a good point. So yeah, it's kind of like when sometimes you hear people use the phrase, it's already built into his pricing. It seems like there could be some of that already built into George's pricing. So I'm glad you said that. And I really wanted to ask you that question. Um, okay, so another guy that we have, so, but it's, it does seem like as I look at George's market overall, <clears throat> even though things are down a little bit, George's pricing seems to be pretty stable in terms of what I see, which I think is a good sign. But segueing over to another guy whose pricing is all over the map. We talked about him earlier in the show. Felipe Drugovich. I texted you this week and I said, is Drugovic a buy? Okay, tell the audience what you said. Uh, I said yes. I think, did I say yes? I know. You we, said we, yes. We had a lot you of, said yes. Yeah, we had a lot of conversations yeah, you, this week, so... Um, yes, of course he's a (laughs) buy because he's, he's leading the F2 championship. But once again, I don't see anywhere in the market. I don't see any hype around Drugovic. And when you look at the next, he's a buy because I don't see his value going down. I mean, from that point, there's no hype around him. I don't know if people don't believe he's going to land a seat in F1. Myself, I don't believe it, but I mean, if you want to sure, you know, there is risk and sure shots. For me, Drugovic is a sure shot for now. 
just because, uh, you know, he's in the 2020 set. You can find 2020 autos for uh, a good price. And even if he doesn't lend a seat in F1, I don't see his value really going down because it hasn't been spiking up. Um, I don't know if you disagree about that or we can show data or something, but there seems to have other drivers that will lend F1 seats before him. Piastri, um, uh, Pourcher, Piastri, Pourcher, Yuri Vips, and many other drivers. So, um, uh, including his fellow Brazilian Fittipaldi. So, even if he does win F2 this year, I mean, we'll see where his future goes. Yeah. I'd love to get the audience's take on Drugovic, uh, for those of you watching and listening that are have been big into F1 uh, cards for the last couple of years or even beyond that. Um, I agree with you. I think he's a buy only because his pricing is so low and it is to me, it's, it's fun and interesting to prospect as an investor. And I advise everyone to have flyers in their portfolio. We talk about goats, heroes, and flyers, and I like a good mix of goats and flyers. I'm not, I'm not as big on heroes and I'll talk about that at some point. They're just a little bit harder to make profit margin on. Um, but flyers are not, if you can, if you have a strategy for them. And I think Greg, Greg's talked about a good strategy with Drugovich, even if he doesn't get called up to F1. And I don't know that much about that personally. Um, Greg, you know, more, you know, more about that than I do, just kind of how that works and how maybe predictable or unpredictable it is. But I think overall, I mean, since he is leading F2, there is a play with him potentially winning the championship and getting some notoriety in that regard. I would also think that when the next season of Drive to Survive comes out, they might be mentioning F2 more and more, and there might be, and because he's winning and leading, you know, maybe, I'm totally guessing, but maybe uh, they mention him in that series more as a guy. But um, what, I do, what I do like about his pricing is that, you know, just this past week, you had, um, I personally missed out on a 2020 uh, Topps Chrome green refractor auto out of 99. It went for $340, which I think is a pretty good price. But what's weird about that is one week earlier, the same card went for $75. And that's why I say his pricing is a little bit over the, all over the map. Then you have more, a more stable s sample size than that is his, um, his, his, regular refractor auto out of 368 from the same set 2020 has gone for 107 in April, 109 May 21st, but it also went for 199 on the same day, May 21st. So it is kind of hop. It's more stable, but it is kind of hopping up. These, to me, those are still low prices for a guy. It's his first auto. And these are low serial numbered cards in a highly, highly regarded set that will, will, will always be the set, the first Topps Chrome. The thing that I would um, caution everybody against, though, is like, be careful not to necessarily buy the 2021 Drugovich cards, just because I just, I think, and we, I could be wrong on this, but my gut tells me that like five, six, seven years from now, it's going to be, that's his second prospect auto. I think it will be defined as his second prospect auto. And if you look mm -hmm. at baseball and how Bowman Chrome has, has shook out over the years, and it's still relatively new, we're probably like eight or so years into kind of Bowman Chrome first prospect auto and then, all, and then everything after the first prospect auto. So I think like we all hypothesize in the F1 card market about, well, what's the difference between an F2 driver's first card, second card, and then their actual rookie card when they get into F1 with the RC on it. And I think you're going to have two valuable card card and variations for each driver. You're going to have their first prospect auto, which I believe will be their most valuable of all time. And then you will have their rookie card auto when they get into F1, which I think will be their second most valuable, like sort of series of cards of all time. Now, 
we all know that the different serial numbers and parallels and all that can make a rookie card or even a second prospect auto potentially more valuable than a first. But I think in general, this you want to avoid the second prospect auto, which for Drugovic would be the 2021 Topps Chrome set. But um, Greg, I know it's early in this, right? We're only in our kind of second year talking about these Topps Chrome sets, but what's your take overall on what I just said and what type of, what, what Drugovic cards would you be going after? And uh, if you're kind of looking to take a flyer here. Well, always, you know, 2020 will always be king in the F1 market. That's, that, that's what I'll say. 2020 will always be king. In the case of Yuki Tsunoda, Guan Zhou, Mick Schumacher, these guys, because they've been promoted to F1 in 2021, well, in the 2021 set, but 2022, have had the RC logo on, uh, on their card. So therefore, there's a debate on who, what set has the real, the true rookie so for their autos, for, you know, any other variations. And it's not the case with Drugovic. You know, Theo, Theo Pochard, first cards in 2021. Same thing for Yuri Vips. Um, so there's a value in the 2021 set in that case. You, you're absolutely right by saying that Drugovic, by not lending a seat in F1 in 2022, you know, it going for second year auto i don't i don't see, i mean it's not that i don't see any value it's still an autograph card depending on the price you can get it if you're a drugovic collector you like it you know you like the driver you want to keep them but if you want to invest and have the money to do so because there's not that much of a price difference i would go with 2020 for sure yeah, that makes sense. And I do I do want to sort of address something that I said in the last show about collecting. I think, you know, obviously it is important. We do want we do want people to be the end owner of these cards, to to treasure them, to value them, to hold them forever as part of just something that they enjoy to own. I certainly have things like that um, you know, in my life. I have a couple you know, Sports Illustrated autograph covers of, of some guys that I like and things like that. And so, so I do, I do think that they're, you know, that's super important. Um, and uh, all right. So with uh, man, with the, you know, the season ends November 20th, essentially. So we're here mm -hmm. in June and we've still got several months left. Uh, one thing that I love about the F1 season is the schedule of it. I love the consistency. I love that it, the races are on Sundays right before the NFL. I love that it's a long season with a short off season, obviously, because uh, there is no off season. But um, <laughs> if you had to make a bold prediction, I'm going to put you on the spot at the end of the show here. Yep. Yep. If you had to make a bold prediction with so, so many races left and you're going to be – you're going to be at the Montreal race, which is super cool. Um, what, what, would you, what, what would you say that, you know, we should maybe not be surprised by that, that you think might happen um, as a bold prediction? As a bold prediction? What do you mean? So something obvious that's going to happen? Uh, well, this would be something that maybe we, it would actually be the opposite of that. So it would be maybe something that we okay. all okay. assume so is going to be take. obvious right now, but it's going to be, sure, hot take. Hot take. Uh, Lewis Hamilton's going to start winning races before long. Nice. Well, okay. Start. I like that. It's going to resume to winning races. Uh, resume. I, I, I like, I, I loved I loved what I saw in Barcelona from that car. Um, he had a lot of pace and he would have finished probably podium if that wasn't for Kevin Magnussen 
bumping into him. He had a puncture, had to pit for new tires and still managed to finish uh, very, uh, he finished five, fifth, so top five. Um, Monaco is not at all suited for Mercedes this year. Uh, they, well, in the new version of the car, which they are just like Red Bull, super fast on, on straights, have a good top speed, uh, are, are good in uh, low speed corners as well. So, I mean, I think, and Lewis loves Montreal. I would go crazy if he wins in Montreal, but I think he's going to resume winning races before long and you will see his prices going back up for sure. I love that. I love that. Well, uh, Greg, thanks so much for co-hosting with me on the F1 Card Strategy Show. This has been episode four. We really want you, the audience, to engage with us for this show because there's not really an F1 only podcast. Now, of course, uh, the Sports Card Strategy feed, we have all sorts of shows. We have the Sports Card Strategy Show, and we do a niche show for each sport. But um, we'd like to collaborate with you, the audience, to really make this your F1 podcast. So check us out on Instagram at Sports Card Strategy or on Twitter at No Offseason Card. And um, shoot me a note a DM, whatever. Uh, if you want to collaborate, join Greg and I on the show. That'd be awesome. There's a lot, of, a lot of you out there that know just as much or more than we do about F1 cards, and we'd love to hear from you. So um, we'd really appreciate that. And, um, you know, just help us out. If you really want to help us out, check out nooffseason.com, the sports card investment report. You can save 20% by using the promo code nooffseason at checkout. And uh, graphs and charts that we use everywhere. Uh, are brought to you by Market Movers app by Sports Card Investor. And it does help us out and help you out if you go there and sign up using the promo code No Offseason. when you get your first month for only $1. So, Greg, thanks again. Everybody, thanks for watching and listening to the F1 Card Strategy Show here on the NoOffSeason.com Sports Card Content Network. Have a great day, and we'll see you next time.